Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, and welcome to an episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Today's guest is Dr. William Stixrude, who is a clinical neuropsychologist and founder of the Stixrude Group. He is a faculty member at Children's National Medical Center and an assistant professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine. In addition to keeping himself busy in that way, he is the co-author with Ned Johnson of the national best-selling book, and I totally advocate all parents read this, The Self-Driven Child, and a new book, What Do You Say? Talking to Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a happy home, which sounds almost impossible, Dr. Stixford. So he's been featured in all kinds of media outlets. I think the first time I heard him speak was on NPR, and I'm really honored to have him as a guest. Welcome. Delighted to be here. Thank you. So for the guests, and actually for myself, what exactly does a neuropsychologist do? So. Neuropsychologists are clinical psychologists who do two years of postdoctoral training in kind of understanding brain behavior relationships, you know, it, it's how, how the brain's organized, how it produces thinking and behavior and memory and learning. And functionally, mainly, mainly what we do is if the kids are having difficulty, if kids, and I'm, I'm a child and adolescent primarily, I see young adults as well, but primarily uh, child and adolescent neuropsychologists, I, I see kids who are, are struggling. If they're, having, if they're having learning problems or attention problems or social problems or emotional problems. So, and we test, we do, we do a, a variety of tests, to try to figure out what are they good at, what's going well, what's hard for them, what's not going well, and how to help. And do the tests often match the experience of the person being tested? For instance, I know that sounds convoluted, but yeah, yeah, yeah. if you think you're good at something, do the tests usually mirror that fact? Well, you know, I, I think some, some people are more <laughs> self-aware than others, uh, no, but, 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 but yeah, but generally, I mean, generally when I, when I give kids feedback about what I learn about them, you know, I, I try to tell them what they already know. You know, so if I see if I see a kid and I do testing and I find out that they they're, they're really they're very bright, they've got great verbal skills. I tell them about that. I say you, know, you got a really good vocabulary. They say I, I I know the teacher says that. And if I talk about attention problems, I say, you know, it looks to me like it's harder for for you to pay attention to stuff that's boring than it probably is for most kids. And and kids with attention problems, say, yeah. So, I mean, generally, the, the answer is yes. Generally, if people are, are, are kind of aware of what, what comes easily, what, what doesn't. Uh, sometimes, you know, really high achieving kids, they're, they're, they're in honors classes or AP classes. And if they are at the top of class, they feel like they're an idiot. Um, and and a, lot of my, a lot of my work is assure, reassuring kids that, 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 that they really do have plenty of ability to do something interesting in this world. One of the things I loved, and we'll get back to neuropsych testing sure, sure, in a sure, minute, sure. but one of the things I loved in your book, The Self-Driven Child, was the false assumptions that if you fall off the trajectory of perfect educational pathway, you're doomed for life. And I loved yeah. that you really address that because I know so many young people, particularly now in COVID, who are falling off that traditional path. Well, it, it's so. Um, when I first moved to the D.C. area, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm from Seattle, and things were a little bit more chill in Seattle than they were in, in D.C. when I got here in the mid '80s. And I, I thought, God, there's a mass psychosis here, because the people, so many people here, seem to believe that the most important outcome of a kid's whole life is is, is where they go to college. And all the research says that, that, that that's completely untrue. That there's virtually no relationship between your success and, 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 and how much money you make, how happy, and, and zero with how happy you are, where you go to college. And I thought that this whole crazy preoccupation 
uh, with always having the right record, building the right resume. And, and as you're saying, Diane, not being able to fall off the path a bit, it just doesn't track with the real world. And, and uh, the, the self-driven child, we have a chapter called Alternate Roots uh, that includes p people who uh, became had successful lives and satisfying lives who did who who, who stumbled and I and I, I talk my own story where I started graduate school um, right after college and I at, at I was in a PhD program in English at Berkeley and I was so anxious and insecure I went for twenty weeks and didn't turn in a single assignment so I flunked out Aww. and. And well, is, is the, it, it took me about two months to realize it was the best possible thing that could have happened to me because there's no way that I should have been an English professor. I always felt like an imposter. I'm not a literary type. But when I find psychology, I thought, these are my people. Okay, I, 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 this comes, I get this. And I've had an incredible, wonderful career as a, as a psychologist. Um, but flunking out of graduate school is the best possible thing that could have happened to me. And I didn't have my first job in my field until I was 34 years old. And once I knew stuff that's helpful to people, nobody nobody ever asked me what what, what why did a lot of people start when they're twenty eight why 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 are you thirty four right. once I right. knew something useful, and so and when I when I learned that you could flunk every single one of your high school classes if you decide that was a bad idea I want to get an education, you can go to community college for 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 a year two semesters, and then you can apply to almost all the country the colleges in the country and they don't want to see your high school transcript. So knowing this kind of stuff, just when I, when I see kids who, um, who just are so anxious and so frightened and so filled with fear that if they aren't always doing they aren't achieving at the top of their possible potential, they'll, have a, they'll, have a, they'll, they'll never make it in life. It's just, it's just psychotic. Psychotic meaning is just out of touch with reality. It is out of touch with reality. I read a study where they did a longevity, long Je long, how do you say that? Longitudinal. Long, longitudinal study of kids who grew up in highly affluent um, suburbs. And what they found was that those who had, you know, focused on their education, their incidence of substance use disorders were higher than other people. Their instances of anxiety and depression were similarly higher in yeah. early adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah there, there's a, there's a, um, there's a researcher initially out of Philadelphia who um, I think is in Texas now, by the name of Sonia Luther, who um, right. used used affluent children as, as a control group in a study of looking at, at effects of poverty, and, and she was stunned twenty years ago to find that affluent kids in high achieving schools were much higher risk, as you said, Diana, for for, for anxiety disorders, for depression, for substance use, for self injury. And, and as you said, just recently, there's, uh, within the last three years, she published a study showing that even by the mid-20s, that this really dramatically increased uh, incidence of anxiety, depression, and substance, uh, substance abuse uh, disorders. Um, and you know, the, 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 the hypothesis about that is, is, is there's, there's, two, there's two reasons that that may be true. And one is um, what, what they call excessive pressure to excel. And the Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation published a report in 2017, 2018, saying, here's the four main causes of mental health problems in adolescence. And it was poverty, trauma, discrimination, and excessive pressure to excel. And then the other factor is, is that m many wow, kids- Wow, wait, I want to yeah. wait. I want to pause yeah, yeah. on that for yeah. a minute. So yeah. the yeah. three, poverty, yeah. trauma, yeah. and- Discrimination. Discrimination, we would all go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I know. But it's, the it's, idea that what we would call that tiger mom or that highly pushing set of parents or community that is expecting great things out of every single one of their youth is a risk yeah. factor. Well, th th isn't that interesting? I, I, I'm, um, I, uh, I, I do a, some work with a, with a, uh, the David Lynch Foundation that, that teaches transcendental meditation to at risk populations, and I'm talking say that this is an at risk population, <laughs> and it's not it's not the, the two hypotheses are about this excessive pressure to excel, and many kids in in, in affluent families in high achieving school they don't feel as close to their parents, and so and we talk about this in our in our new book, but one of the things that we recommend more than anything else, really for, for parents, is spend time alone with each one of your kids. 
Uh, there, there's nothing that, that that's nothing that builds that feeling of closeness uh, better than being alone. And many family members are just so busy, they have family time, but they don't have that kind of one-on-one -on -one time that really allows parents to connect with their kids and, and vice versa. Uh, and, but certainly, you know, part of the challenge is, is in the high achieving schools, you know, this, the environment itself is, is in many ways toxic in the sense that, that it, it promotes that chronic sense of stress and not, not doing enough and uh, competition with my friends, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So as a psychologist, where is that fine balance between expecting, you know, our kids to really, really work and not expecting them to be in a cookie cutter mold. What is that? Where does yeah. that come? Well, you know, I, in our new book, we talk about expect, you know, parent, what does it mean to have expectations? And it turns out that parents' expectations are really highly correlated with uh, kids' achievement. However, it, it's, it's not, I, I, I expect you in meaning that, that I'm going to be really disappointed if you don't. Expect, expectation means I have confidence that you can. And that's the thing is, is that it's, it's when, when we see kids who are just we, whole schools where kids think they have to get into Ivy League schools, our angle, when I say our, my, my co-author, our, our, our angle is that going, there's nothing wrong. It's, it's fine to go, go to elite schools. It's simply not necessary to have an incredible life. And I think that for me, that, that that's the challenge that the kids, the kids don't realize that the message is, is not, there's some advantages to it. If you, if you want to do it, go for it versus you'll have a, you'll have an inferior life if you don't. And so my, my sense is that we want to, that I don't know, I frankly, raising my kids, I didn't know who they were supposed to be, that, that they aren't mm -hmm. me. And I didn't, I, I, and I, I really felt that I, I didn't always know it was in their best interest. I mean, the sense that I, I thought it was in my best interest to go to, to Berkeley and graduate school, but it turned out that that, that, that was a bad idea. And, but, and, and I, I want kids to, to be able to learn from mistakes and, and, and trust their own judgment. So I, I think that the idea that I know what's right for you, that, that, that I expect you to do this, this and that because I know the path for you, is, is mistaken in the sense we don't really know. They don't really know who they're going to be. And one of the coolest things that anybody ever said to me, and I don't remember who it was so long ago, they said, one of the great things about raising adolescents is that when they come home from school every day, you get to see who they're deciding to be. And so my, my answer to your question is, is that about expectations is, is express confidence that you, you can do something really interesting in this world. You've got a really good mind. You're a wonderful person. And I'll support you any way I can. But, but don't weigh kids down with the idea that somehow th this, this is the only path for you. I, I, I know much better than you do who you're supposed to be um, like that. That's great. So back to neuropsych testing. Could neuropsych testing be a helpful tool for them to understand in what direction they might go or how to be more successful in school currently? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think that... I, I personally, and I'm biased because I do, do this for a living, have for 40 years. But, but I think it's useful to know, you know, what you're good at and what and what, what you're and and, and uh, what you're not good at. And, and many kids think, uh, many kids, that, especially in high achieving schools, and uh, they, they think, I'm not very good in math because there's a couple kids in my class who are better than I. And they're the most you compare. Well, I, I compare to kids when I test kids. I'm comparing them to other kids around the country, and I'm saying to you, you're in the top eight percent out of kids your age in the country, even though there may be 10 kids in your math class better than you, you're in the top 8%. And if you love math, that's, that's, a, that's plenty of mathematical talent to, do, to use math for a living, uh, like, right. like that. Uh, there, there are people who want to be an architect, and I test, test them, and they just don't have very good spatial ability. They, they, they may be really good uh, abstract artists, but they, don't, they aren't going to repli replicate things. They, they, aren't gonna, they aren't, don't have the kind of spatial ability that allows you to look at something and build it. And so I, I talked about various aspects, things that they can do with, with, their, with their creativity or whatever, but, but, and, I, and I don't try, try to talk them out of becoming an architect. But I just said that, that if you want to do that, go for it. And I also want you to have a plan B because I, I think I think there's, there, you have some real strengths in this other area here that you want, I want you to consider. So why wouldn't we want this for all of our children? Well, uh, so, some years ago, I, I wanted to start a program where, I, where, where because so many of the families that I see who bring me a kid who's having trouble, 
they, they really they say this is pretty interesting. That this it's useful to know you know what what he's really good at, what's harder for him, have some ideas about how to help him. I, I want to do th- my, my set. My other kids not have any problem, but I'd love, I'd love to see the same thing on him. So you know, it's 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 time consuming. It's mm-hmm. not cheap, um, which is why we just don't do it for everybody. And and, and there's not a lot of there's, it's not a surplus of people who are really well trained to do this. Uh, but ideally. Yeah, p- people know. I mean, I, I, I took I took an IQ test um, when I was twenty years old to see if I was going to be draftable to go to Vietnam, and I got an average score, and and it, it surprised me because I was a good college student, and they let me look at the test, and I was above average in vocabulary and verbal reasoning, but I was I just sucked at all the spatial tests and the tests involving tools. What tool would you use? And, and, and it rang with my experience because <laughs> I'm clearly inept spatially and I can't fix anything. I can't build anything. Uh, but but I, I think that it kind of confirmed to me that, that, that I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm better than, than, than a lot of people in, in, in vocabulary and verbal reasoning and various things. Uh, so I, 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 ideally, yeah, we, 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 we'd have tests that, that, that are valid. And uh, for me, the, the, my major goal is try to help kids understand themselves in a way that's encouraging to them. So that okay, this is hard for you, but 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 you can do this. You you can get around this, or, or in, in, in ten years, your brain's with, with the frontal lobe maturation, your brain's going to be completely different, and you're going to be able to compensate for this. Don't give up. That's great. So let's talk about the medication issue. I would imagine that many of the people who come see you are seeking either an ADD. Or ADHD diagnosis or rule out in some ways, and then we mm-hmm. have the medication issue. Yeah. Where do you fall on medication? Well, it's an interesting question, Diana. I started at, because because I've been meditating for almost fifty years, and and um, I and, and I've been yo- doing yoga for forty five years. I'm not a big medication guy by temperament in, in general. And my when I first started my practice in DC. I had a reputation for a couple of years as somebody who, who knew a lot about ADHD, um, but, but didn't recommend re- medication, uh, tr- tr- try alternatives. And what happened with me was that nobody ever came back and said that, that homeopathy or Ayurveda, or this is some other, uh, uh, some nutritional thing ever really helped very much. And, and enough mm-hmm. people came back and said, we, we got desperate. We tried the medication. We should have done this two years ago. And I saw, I, mean, I, I saw a kid who, whose mother, who, who, who on, on my testing was brilliant spatially. He could, he could he'd take these blocks and match designs like a genius. And I, he's like six years old. I said to his parents, how, how, does, how does this show up at home? They said, we've never seen this. The first dose of Ritalin, this kid has ADHD. The first dose of Ritalin, this kid goes into a room where the, where the Legos are and he doesn't come out. And his mom's a little worse. She, goes, she peeks in and 45 minutes later, he's built this enormous structure with Legos and she bursts into tears that had no Aww. idea this was he's capable of doing it. And so at that point, I had enough experiences like that, Diana, that I thought, who do I owe this black and white attitude to? And so mm-hmm. my attitude about medication is, is if kids are really, if they're really suffering, if they're holding, if, if things are, if they're really being held back, try the medicine see what it does, and then decide whether to use it or not. Because oftentimes it's just, it, it's, it answers itself. It, you know, it doesn't help very much, so you don't use it. Or the side effects outweigh, outweigh the benefits, you don't use it. If it helps you 15%, it's probably not worth it. But if, it, right. you're one of these, but if you're one of these people where it's like turning on a light switch, you know, that, that okay, you, you can use it or not. But, 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 but So I'm open to it. And then I, I, there's, there's no question. I mean, my own son said he, he wouldn't have gotten through college or graduate school um, without taking it. And he doesn't love. Mm-hmm. He, he's never. He never loved the way he felt on it. So once he once he was working as a psychologist, he didn't really need. He didn't doesn't take it. It's all interpersonal. He's great interpersonally without the medicine. Um, but um, so I, I think that and most, there, you know, certainly there are there are kids, particularly in college, who abuse Adderall. Uh, but generally. People don't want to take these medications chronically because they don't really help them because they don't like you know, it suppresses their appetite or that mm-hmm. makes, makes trouble sleeping or makes them a little bit more irritable. So speed. I, I, well, it, it is, and, and it, they're, they're stimulants. The, the ADHD medicines, the ones that work, are stimulants. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, for, for some kids, it's just it really is like just turning on a light switch. And then they say, "Is this the way most people can focus?" It, you know, it's like putting on glasses. Yeah. Uh, but but it, it's it's commonly a, a matter of balancing 
to the benefit of the side effects. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend other behavioral strategies in addition to medication when somebody has a diagnosis of ADHD? Well, this, yeah, I, I think that there's 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 one new FDA uh, a, a, a treatment program for kids seven to twelve. It's called the Monarch Trigeminal Stimulation System. Um, but I, I don't know anybody who's tried it yet. But there's, there's one now. Um, but um, the other thing that I recommend certainly exercise. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. that many many people I know, and including the young adults. Um, with ADHD, they exercise vigorously, then they, they, they can work with pretty good focus for a couple hours. Um, so exercise is one, because stress mimics ADHD. I mean, you think about it, if you're stressed, you can't focus. If you're stressed, mm -hmm. it's really hard to organize your thinking. It's really hard to get stuff done if you're highly stressed. And so, um, so it's, 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 anything that reduces stress. I mean, it's, so, so the, I'm a huge fan of meditation. We, we, I did a couple uh, studies uh, 10 years ago or so on transcendental meditation and, and kids with ADHD, high, middle school kids with, uh, with ADHD. And we got really nice results behaviorally. We got really nice changes in the brain. That this one kid, middle school kid, who was wildly impulsive um, before he started meditating, we, we interviewed the kids after the study and we said, so what did you notice? And all, all the kids said, I, I can focus better. I mean, they all said I'm less anxious. Most of them said I can focus better. This one kid said, before I started meditating, if I was walking in the hall and somebody bumped me, I just turn around and hit him. But now that I've been meditating, if I'm walking in the hall, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? And we, we thought, well, this is pretty good improvement, you know? So I, I, I think that, that exercise- A stop sign in the brain, yeah. Well, yeah. So, and, and, and certainly there's a really interesting study that was done a few years ago with, 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 with uh, fourth graders and sixth graders. And the sixth graders were, well, part of the story is interesting. The sixth graders, some of them were paid to stay up an hour later than normal for three nights in a row. Most of them couldn't stay up a full hour later. They fell asleep, but, but they, mm -hmm. they, on average, they got 35 minutes less sleep a night than usual for three hours. The sixth graders who got that half hour less sleep, they functioned like fourth graders on cognitive tests. That they lost two years. And, and so sleep is huge. You're tired, you can't focus. You, you're tired, you, you, your prefrontal cortex doesn't work. Doesn't What we want, you know, that, that, that the self-driven child, it's about how important a sense of control is for, 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 for people to have a sense of control. This is my life and I'm not overwhelmed, I'm not passive, I'm not resigned, I'm not giving up. And part of, part of that is a subjective sense of agency, you know, that, I, I, that I, I'm in command of my own life. And part of that is the brain state that supports it, which is the prefrontal cortex, the recently evolved part of the brain that can think and put things in perspective and can calm yourself down when you're upset, regulates the rest of the brain, including the, the, the amygdala, which senses and reacts to threat. And so we want you know, kids to be in a brain state that supports mm -hmm. that healthy sense of control. And if they're tired or if they're highly stressed, they can't get there. They don't stay there. So get a good night's sleep, Eat a good diet, exercise. And yeah, the, 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 next, basically, right? so the, the, my, my, I made peace with the fact many years ago that when medicine works, nothing comes close. The, the, right. that, in my experience, however, ha, having, there's a lot of kids who take medicine who are getting four hours a night of sleep, and, and they're, they're still functioning like zombies. You know, because the medicine, the medicine, that if you're tired, it doesn't make you really awake. It, it keeps you awake. It, but it doesn't really rest you. I mean, it, it, and it doesn't make you more alert necessarily. Uh, so I, I think that it really it, it's it's medicine, and then healthy healthy brain care. And I, I know people who've gone to college and or, grad, or law school exercise twice a day because they can just focus so much better after mm -hmm. the exercise. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. people who get, you get an extra hour of sleep, you, you everything's better. You're more present. You're more focused. You're you're you're, you're better. You can put things in perspective better. So. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but yeah, I think those are the main things for me. Thank you. So anything else you'd like our audience to know before we sign off for today? Well, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, here's what I'll say. Um, as a neuropsychologist who studies, somebody who studied the brain for, for a long time, I, I'm just grateful that I, for many years ago, I learned some really useful things about the brain. And one is how slow it is to develop. 
And what I, I learned probably 30 years ago or 25 years ago that the prefrontal cortex that I'm talking about here that, 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 that does all the executive functions and, and is so important for self-regulation, the cognitive functions aren't, aren't mature until 25 plus minus three. The emotional regulation functions not mature until 32 plus minus three. So don't give, don't give, there's no scientific basis for giving up hope on, on young people because the, you got a 21 year old brain, it's going to be di very different when they're 23 and when they're 25. Um, and I think that, and, and, and that's, that's maybe the most useful thing I've learned with the exception or the possible exception of this idea that when you're in your right mind and your kids in your right mind, meaning you're focused, you're engaged, you're, 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 you're active, you're, you're aware, you're present, you're motivated, you're goal-directed. The prefrontal cortex is regulating the rest of the brain and what, 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 and, and including the stress response, including the, the amygdala that initiates that stress response. And what we, we know that the, the best neurological marker of that, that kind of, of, of that, that of, of a resilient brain is the strength of the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, this, this, this primitive part of the brain that senses reactive threat. What we want for young people is to, is to develop in a way where they develop beautiful connections between the prefrontal cortex and, and the amygdala. And we do that in part by stimulating them. Making, we don't want them to be bored, we want them to be, but, but not having them be chronically tired and stressed. For me, being tired, too tired and too stressed for too long, it's a formula for becoming depressed. We don't want kids to become depressed if they don't have to because it changes the brain in a way that, that, that doesn't help them. Uh, so I, I think that, that the main thing for me is don't give up hope that the, the brain keeps developing. And with the main priority, take good care of the brain. I like that. Well, thank you, Dr. Sixer. And we appreciate you joining us today. This has been an episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. If you would like us on your platform of choice, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.